Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar or this webcast of Breaking the Chain. Tonight, we welcome, um, uh, for the fourth time, our featured guest, J.P. Dice, and we're going to discuss aviation weather. That's me, Jeremy Walters, ATP, Master CFI, veteran in the United States Army Reserves, former A-64 pilot, and I'm an aviation content creator. I love to teach, mentor, um, give uh, advice and lessons to folks. And I couldn't do all of this without the support of my beloved family. That's my wife, Talia, and our five kids. Tonight, we'll be assisted by, uh, once again, Eric Day, who's an instrument-rated private pilot, an aircraft owner, and a software engineer by a trade. He also flies a Mooney 20 Juliet model, as well as <laughs> our guest speaker tonight, uh, JP Dice. JP's a CFI. He's no longer a television news chief meteorologist, but that's what, but that's what he did in his past life. And now he's flying a Gulfstream 4. And he also has a uh, aviation uh, YouTube channel called Beyond the, the Briefing, which you can check his YouTube channel out. All right. I'm going to cut the chase. And go ahead and, and, and hand off the webinar to JP. J JP, welcome to Breaking the Chain once again, sir. Yeah, fourth time, Jeremy. I, I appreciate the invite. And uh, certainly uh, uh, in, a, in a fine uh, group of company with uh, 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 folks that you've had on like Patty Wagstaff and Mike Bush and some of the uh, very well-known folks in, uh, in aviation, Rod Machado as well. And here I am in, in, in Birmingham, just a, just a little old weather guy who has uh, turned Gulfstream pilot. But uh, thank you very much. And, and what I want to talk about tonight is uh, winter weather, okay? So we're gonna we're heading into the cool season and we're not immune to not only severe weather, but we're also not immune to uh, other types of weather as well, including uh, icing. So we'll go ahead and uh, get started here. Uh, that's my information uh, beyond the briefing. I've got some videos there on aviation weather. Feel free to check those out on YouTube. Uh, love to see what you think of them. Uh, we go anything from how to forecast the weather to how do you get ready for a check ride, what you need to know about METARs and TAFs. Uh, so I'm a meteorologist. That CBM stands for Certified Broadcast Meteorologist. Uh, I did that for 26 years at the Fox affiliate in Birmingham. Also, uh, airline transport pilot and uh, a flight instructor. So still an active flight instructor and uh, uh, enjoy flying uh, jets these days. Uh, hold on just a second. Let me get back to this. All right. 75% uh, of weather-related uh, accidents in aviation are deadly. Those stats are coming from the NTSB. So very serious that we pay attention to weather. Somebody a long time ago, before I even thought about uh, flying airplanes or taking the lessons, uh, told me if we could stop people from running out of gas or flying into bad weather, we would eliminate most of the general aviation accidents. And I kind of chuckled at that, but the more I got into aviation and more I started reading NTSB reports, the more I figured out Wow, there is some level of truth to that. Uh, that tends to disappear the higher you go in aviation and flying more capable aircraft and certainly with more professional flight crews. But we go throughout history, we're not immune to it. We have uh, lots of cases of severe weather uh, causing airplane crashes or at least becoming uh, contributing factors. We saw that in 1985 Delta Flight 191 with the uh, microburst or the wind shear uh, situation there. So uh, it is, we're not immune to it, even from the, the lowest levels of aviation to the highest levels. So we need to understand the weather. And what I'm finding out, there's a lot of folks that think they understand the weather, but they don't completely understand the weather. Uh, we kind of get a cursory knowledge of weather when we are going through our aviation uh, ratings. What the FAA wants you to know to pass the test. But there's a lot more to weather than that, obviously. Why so many weather-related accidents? A uh, number of factors get their itis. I, I got to get to that destination. I've got a meeting. I, I got to go to work. Uh, I got to get somebody back uh, for their meeting. A lot of external pressures that we tend to talk about. I have been there, done that before, and I survived. A lot of that. Hey, I've flown through a thunderstorm like that, or I've flown through this level of icing, and it hasn't been a problem before. 
Well, he may have gotten lucky. It could have been a little bit different that time. Number of factors. Not realizing the limitations of the data. And we're running into that more and more these days with people not understanding the data that they're seeing and the capabilities of all that data coming into the airplane. Uh, these days, we've got more information than we've ever had before. And it's really, really good stuff, but we need to understand that data. And also not having a backup or an escape plan. We have a forecast and we're basing our trip on that forecast or the weather data or the TAFs or what radar is showing us at the present time and we get in the midst of things and it's not working out as expected. What's our backup plan? Where are we going to land? What's our alternate? We're taught about alternates with instrument flying. Always have an alternate, have a backup plan. How am I going to get myself out of this mess? And again, I don't know what I don't know. There's a lot of that that goes on in aviation. I can, as a guy that's been doing the weather a long time uh, and forecasting the weather a long time, I can sit in an FBO and be in some city where nobody knows anything about me. And I hear people talk about the weather. I go, Man, they really, they don't have a concept of what's going on in the atmosphere. Uh, so you need to be a student of meteorology to a certain degree. Uh, if you're going to fly airplanes. So we're moving into the cool season. Advantages of the cool season flying. Better aircraft performance because of lower density altitude that just leaps off the ground. We like that. Many cases, the ride is smoother for pilots and passengers. A lot of times we have a very stable atmosphere. Uh, we may have some lower clouds and we have some stratiform clouds and some lower ceilings at times during the cool season, but it's really smooth. And you can capitalize on some incredibly strong tailwinds. Uh, during this time of the year, we start to see the winds increase, the upper level winds. You get high enough, you can get a strong tailwind. You can also, on the same token, get a very strong headwind. Capitalize on those. Learn about the layers of the atmosphere, where we're going to be looking at those stronger headwinds or tailwinds. Use that to your advantage. Cooler temperatures on the ground for aircraft with no air conditioning. For those of us like uh, Eric that has a uh, Mooney 201, I have, I have a 201 myself, no air conditioning. So in the summertime, when you're, you're, you're 10 deep in aircraft taxiing out sometimes like it is in Birmingham, and you're sitting there, it's like, oh my gosh, it's hot. This time of the year, it's typically a lot more comfortable. Disadvantages of cool season flying, and there are many, more IFR days, low overcast. So if you're a VFR only pilot, uh, you have some days you have to kind of wait things out. Airframe icing, thunderstorms and severe weather. This time of the year, you can also have some very active weather because the jet stream becomes more active. You have more powerful cold fronts coming across and you can't have from frozen precipitation. Anything from um, freezing rain, freezing fog, heard of that one? There's actually such a thing that can stick to the airframe. And uh, you also have the, the icing on the airframe. How do I manage risk? Be weather aware. Get that weather briefing. Uh, look at the data that's coming into the airplane. Sirius XM, uh, the ADSB data, METARS, TAFs, model data, weather apps. A lot of information there. Uh, apps like uh, ForeFlight, fantastic to get that uh, weather information, get the briefing on there. You can get the current conditions. You can look at all of the weather imagery. It's all right there on your iPad in the airplane or before you take off. You can look at all that or days before you leave. You actually have to stay entrenched in the weather when you are the PIC of an aircraft and, and planning a trip, especially an airplane that may have somewhat limited uh, capabilities uh, in uh, weather. And that means not being able to get above the weather, not having uh, known icing capabilities and so forth. Uh, understand your systems on the airplane, anti-ice, DI system, TKS, boots, heated wings, pedo heat, AOA, uh, anti-ice. Know the limitations of those systems. Sometimes those systems are finite, like your TKS. You only have so much of that fluid in the airplane. Any, any kind of airplane that has a weeping wing, there's only so much of that fluid. Uh, understand that maybe this is something to get you through a transition transitional layer uh, and not living in that icing. Maybe you're like me, I have no ice protection at all except for you know a heated uh, pedo tube. 
But as far as the airplane goes, there's no heated wings. There's no TKS on my Mooney. You stay away from that mess. Uh, experiencing cool season flying. You know, is this your first trip to uh, Wisconsin uh, and you're a pilot that flies in Florida all the time? That's going to be a new world to you during the winter season, during the cool season. And what's my escape plan? Always have this filed in the back of your head. What is my escape plan if things don't go as planned? The get out of jail uh, card there. Uh, something I get a lot of questions on uh, for folks that you'll see this on four flight, you'll see MOS. What is MOS data? MOS data is model output statistics. So you can look at the TAF and you can look at the METAR. The METAR is what's happening right now. The TAF is a forecast and that's out every six hours. That's the National Weather Service office. Your local office puts that uh, out there. Uh, it's the local office to the, uh, the airport that you're flying out of or into. If you're flying into Miami, it's gonna be the Miami National Weather Service office. If you're flying out of Austin, it's gonna be the Austin National Weather Service office. So people have touched that. They've actually made that forecast sky is gonna be uh, clear or broken at 3,500, what the winds are gonna be, if it's gonna be raining or not. That's actually a TAF as a forecast from a real person. Moss is not. Moss comes from a computer. Moss is computer generated. It goes out uh, in time much more uh, or farther than, than the TAF does. So it goes out a few days. So you're thinking, well, that's pretty cool, and it is, but it may not be right. It's what a computer thinks is going to happen. So use caution when you're looking at this uh, MOS data because no human has intervened on that. That is straight off a computer model. The TAF is created by the National Weather Service meteorologist and is more reliable. But uh, again, the MOS can kind of give you a preview of the weather forecast, but it's not a forecast. It is model data. Uh, one tab that I suggest you use is the forecast discussion. Uh, that is issued several times a day by the local National Weather Service office or local to the airport that you're getting the forecast for. And this is a um, really a, a behind the scenes look at what the meteorologist uh, there producing the forecast is thinking. Uh, they may be thinking about the potential for severe weather, potential for microbursts, potential for high winds. They'll write all of that in there. Uh, some of it is written a, a little bit in weather jargon, but a lot of it is a very much plain English, unlike what it used to be. It used to be almost, almost code words and uh, back written almost like a METAR back when you really had these lower baud rates with uh, computers and teletypes, so you had to abbreviate everything. But make sure you look at that forecast discussion. A lot of good information there. Do not discount that. Look at that information. It's going to help you. Data leak weather includes FISB and Sirius XM. Um, Sirius XM, the data comes from two different providers. If you're a Garmin customer, it's going to be coming from Barron. If you're, Barron's a company in Huntsville uh, here in Alabama that uh, is kind of the conduit for that data. If you are uh, using another avionics platform, it may be coming from what used to be WSI. It's now called the Weather Company. Fantastic tool, does have limitations, both the FISB and Sirius XM. The significant difference uh, between FISB and Sirius XM, one's free, one's not, right? FISB is your ADSB. That's coming to you from the government. It is free, it's still cool stuff. The resolution is not gonna be quite as good. You're going to have, not going to have as many data products there. Time-wise, it's about the same delay. Remember, this is delayed data. It's not like having that real-time radar in the nose of the airplane. On the G4, we have the Honeywell radar there. Uh, very nice radar. Some of those uh, G4s have 10,000 watt X-band radars. Great for giving you the, the tactical view of what's happening with the weather. Uh, just keep in mind on most of the GAA planes, and we're looking at this data, uh, at the earliest, it's going to be about five minutes old. At the latest, it could be 20 minutes old because of radar volume scans, processing, and transmission. Still gives you a pretty good idea what's going on. And it's not going to be quite the resolution of what you would have on some of the weather apps like Radar Scope, which I suggest you get. Radar Scope works on your phone. It costs about 10 bucks a year, but it is fantastic data. Not going to work in the air unless you had a, a Wi Fi connection, but uh, you're going to have the full resolution with uh, an app like that. 
Here's what you have in the airplane, gives you a good idea, but again, does have some limitations. And one of the limitations is going to be that delay and, and next red radar in itself has a bit of a delay and that's because it's a volume scanning radar. It looks at every elevation of the, of, of the, the cloud and then comes back down. So it goes around, tilts up, goes around, tilts up, does this 14, I think it's 14 layers and it gives you the complete picture of the storm. That whole thing is about a five minute process. When they have it in the severe weather mode, it's about a 90 minute, uh, 90, yeah, about a 90 second process. So they do cut it down. They've got some modes of the radar that will expedite that, but usually it's about a five minute process. Other information I'd like you to look at is the Storm Prediction Center information that's available in uh, images on Four Flight. Uh, it's also on the internet, a lot of places you can get that storm prediction center is going to highlight over the next three days, the areas that are most likely to see severe weather. And they go from a, um, a general risk of severe weather to marginal, and then you have slight, and then you get into an enhanced risk, then a moderate risk, and a high risk. So those are the layers of severe weather. The green, of course, is generalized thunderstorms where you have that magenta color. That's where you're gonna have a severe weather outbreak across, uh, and this particular graphic, it's gonna be there across Illinois and uh, Indiana. So that's where you'd really have some thunderstorms that could uh, produce tornadoes and hail and so forth. This is a QLCS, a quasi-linear convective system. Uh, squall line is what we've called it historically. Uh, that's what it looks like. Tough thing for us to deal with in, in smaller general aviation airplanes, even in the larger planes. If we can't get across this, can't go over the top, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a bad ride. And you're going to have, but usually if you are in a, in a jet aircraft, you can get on top of this and kind of weave in and out of some of the taller towers associated with it. But if you're in a Mooney, if you're in a, you know, a, a Cirrus, you're just not going to be able to, you're going to have to park it and wait for this to pass because believe me, you don't want to go in there. Don't think you can go in there and it's going to be any kind of reasonably decent experience. It's not. Uh, it could be a lethal experience. We've seen that time and time again. Uh, historically, people think they can deal with this and find a little hole here and there. I wouldn't mess with it. I, I really would stay away from that. There's going to be hail in there, high winds, um, Tornado threats, not particularly strong with that, but it's still a possibility. Uh, the QLCS or quasi-linear convective system is found along and ahead of cold fronts. Intense precipitation, severe winds, lightning, some cases tornadoes. If you're gonna see a tornado, it's gonna be on the Southern tip of that typically. Wind shear, intense updrafts, almost impossible to fly so you, or deviate around. Best avoidance is landing, wait for this to pass and continue your trip. All right, so that's the severe stuff. Those are the big storms with these uh, cold fronts. A lot of times you get during these uh, severe weather or active weather transition periods this time of the year, icing. Adverse effects to flight, increased drag, decreased lift, reduced thrush, increased weight. None of which is going to be good for us all degrade our performance on an airplane, even frost on the wings. I know it does. It, it really changes the performance of the airplane, the clean wing concept. You don't want to go out there even with frost on the wing and, and fly the airplane. You need to get that stuff off of there. Let the sun take care of it or you brush it off or whatever you need to do. So we have a lot of different kinds of icing. We have clear icing. Uh, it's clear. By, hence the name, smooth and glossy, favorable conditions, large droplets and cumuliform clouds, freezing rain or terrain effects. So there's your clear icing, leading edge of the wings. The uh, um, could be on the tail plane of the airplane. You can get some clear icing on the prop. It's a problem. Then you have rime icing. This is on the nose cone of uh, a jet there. It's rough and coarse. Uh, of course, you're going to have uh, some degraded performance in the airplane, a lot more drag with what you've got there. Small, super cool droplets and stratiform clouds. 
and it is going to be just very bumpy on the airplane. And then you have the mixed icing, which is going to be uh, a combination of both the clear and you're going to be looking at the rime icing there. So liquid and frozen particles coexist in wet snow. Again, the leading edges of the wings, props, exposed surfaces. Sometimes some airplanes, the tailplane is going to be susceptible to it. Uh, we don't actually on the on the Gulf Stream 4, we don't have ice protection up there. Uh, historically, uh, that is not a place where ice builds up, nor I, I used to fly some a Sabre liner, and we didn't have ice protection back there. A lot of that has, has, has to do with the, the uh, engineering of the airplane, the aerodynamics. There are places on an airplane where you just don't see that build up, but typically you're going to be looking at that on the, uh, on the wings. And of course, some airplanes do have the boots on the, um, on the tail uh, as well. So here's a super cool droplet example. This one really gets my attention because you get those super cool droplets of water and you add more water to it and more ice is built up. This would be uh, similar to flying through those super cool droplets making contact with the aircraft skin. So actually what you're looking at here, you've got water that is going to be below freezing in the cloud. It's below freezing and still liquid as it touches the aircraft surface or more ice on the airplane, it is going to further build up. So that's an example of, of that liquid water uh, touching the airplane it is going to really get exaggerated there. Interesting graphic here, where super cooled large droplets found. Uh, and when you read the uh, reports there in your discussions, your briefings, the SCD, super cooled droplets, these things are bad news. They can be found through the entire depth of the cloud, but more likely to occur in the relatively warm and low altitude clouds where a lot of our piston airplanes would be flying during the cool season. Look for cloud tops about 12,000 feet with cloud temperatures warmer than minus 12 degrees Celsius. You finally get to a point that you're so cold, there's just not a lot of moisture in the air for any kind of ice buildup. You're going to find that ice buildup typically in the lower uh, altitudes of the troposphere, not the higher altitudes. Hence, when you're, you're flying at 35, 40,000 feet, you're really not using ice protection aside from a pedo or AOA on an airplane. Uh, a few exceptions to that, but typically not. Where does most icing occur between zero and minus 20 degrees Celsius? This is usually found in the mid levels of the clouds. So in this particular diagram, you can see the cloud top, there's ice crystals only. And then farther uh, down below, you have water droplets, droplets only. It's gonna be in that mid layer is where you're gonna be looking at the, the, the clear ice and the rime ice right there in that sweet spot, zero to minus 20 degrees Celsius. So you can find out a lot of information out there uh, these days, readily available on your uh, tablets, on the computer, anywhere you can have a uh, internet source, Aviation Weather Center. A lot of the images that you'll see on ForeFlight, this is where they come from, the Aviation Weather Center, and that's going to be in Kansas City. Uh, you can look at forecast icing, freezing levels. You can see those layers where you're more likely to see the ice build up, uh, especially um, good for uh, planning a trip where you're going to be uh, transversing a, a large geographic area where the weather, say in Birmingham or in Austin, Texas, or down south is going to be considerably different than your, your destination. Also, don't discount the pirates. Um, what the pilots are reporting. Are they looking at moderate icing or severe icing? And make note what kind of aircraft reported it. What could be uh, light icing for a 737 or a 777 is going to be severe icing to a smaller airplane. So this is showing maximum icing severity, 1,000 feet MSL to flight level 300. And it's going to outline what parts of the country are going to have the worst icing on this particular day. This is going to be back in 2020, Sunday, uh, October 18th, and it does have the uh, the time uh, that uh, timestamp on there. So you can see worst icing. You're going to go up to Michigan or maybe Ohio, or you get back into Montana if you're flying around Florida or Texas. Piece of cake. Uh, no issue even in the Northeast, but these are great tools to use in forecasting if you're going to be able to make that trip or not. And you can adjust that altitude for altitudes that you are likely to fly. Let's say you adjust it for 10,000 to 30,000 feet, all right? And below that, you're not going to be looking at the icing. So figure out what altitude you want to, you want to fly and adjust the graphic for that. 
Avoiding ice with data link weather. So you can look at the icing layers, cloud tops. Um, now, Sirius XM data is going to give you the tops from observations, which is pretty handy. The Fizz B is going to give you the forecast, um, basically from model data. So you, you do get some value added from looking at the uh, data providers where you pay for it versus the free stuff. Free is good, but you can, if you pay for it, you'll get a little bit better uh, information, which is often helpful to us. Situational awareness is key. Do you check the weather days in advance? You know, if this were a classroom, I'd say show of hands. How many out there are flying a trip? How many check the weather days in advance? I obsess about it. I really do. I will look at it and look at it and look at it and look at it uh, to make sure that I'm not missing anything. In the G4, we're, we're not doing that as much because we're, we're able to get above 99% uh, of the weather. And of course, um, you know, we'll look at thunderstorm potential and things like that in uh, places that we're going to be taking off and landing. But if you're in a smaller plane, you look at the entire route, you look at every little detail, because you, once you're in it, it's going to be tough to, to deal with it. So you want to make sure you have a lot of plans available to get out of it. I'll give you a recent example, somewhat recent. This was back in July. And we were moving my mom uh, up here to Birmingham. And I go down in my airplane, take my wife with me, and, and we go down to Tampa. And they're going to come back on, on, on the airlines. And I come back, got a bunch of my mom's stuff in the airplane. I come back in, in, in our airplane. And it is a piece of cake coming out of Tampa. No issue. We get down to South Alabama and Georgia. As expected, it is nuts. It is terrible weather. I'm having to weave and dodge, still staying out of it. And uh, wouldn't you know, I'm almost to Birmingham, and I'm talking to the controller, and the controller said, 3-3 um, three, three Yankee Zulu, uh, it's moving toward the field. You better, uh, you better speed it up. And I, I said, I'm pedaling as fast as I can. So I'm doing about 160 plus knots. I mean, I am moving, uh, trying to get to uh, the airport. And I get there. And there's 30, 35, 40 knot winds now at the field. Thunderstorms moving in. There is a um, uh, 135 operator who's going to their alternate. I tell the controller, hey, I'm out of here. I, I had already picked out an airport that was my backup plan. And uh, I start heading that way. And it's, it's a bumpy ride, but I'm still not technically in the bad weather at that point. And get about... I don't know, five minutes south of the field. This thing passes through pretty quick. Controller hits me up. He's like, hey, it, it's passed through. Looks pretty good right now. I, I take a look back. Doesn't look bad. Come back in, land successfully. That was my backup plan. I had my backup plan if that field was not going to work. And I still, that was a good trip, Tampa to Birmingham, but still had plenty of gas left in the plane too. So I could, I made sure that I wouldn't get in one of those high pressure situations where I don't have any fuel and, and I got to get down. You don't want to do that. Multiple sources of weather data. Do you continue to check the weather? Is the weather behaving as forecast? Do you check that weather in the plane over and over again? You better be doing that. Are you listening to other pilots and ATC reports? There's a wealth of information you can get by listening to ATC, just listening to what's on frequency and what they're talking about and people that are deviating. If they got a smooth ride, um, if they just went through it and it wasn't too bad. Be mindful of that. How do you determine the freezing layer? You know, you could do that with uh, the data that's out there on the internet. There's no mystery to it. Uh, through SKU T charts, uh, you can look at real time or almost real time SKU T charts, not real time, but the balloon soundings that are done in the morning and the evening. And you can also look at the forecast data. There's actually virtual SKU T's that are based on forecast data, and that will show you, you know, tomorrow at two o'clock what the freezing level is going to be. So what you look at is that zero isotherm down at the bottom, and you see if your temperature line at whatever altitude, the altitude's on the left-hand side in millibars, if you're left or right of that line. If you're left of that line, you're going to be below freezing. If you're right of that line, you're above freezing. So uh, go to one of my videos on uh, my YouTube channel, and you'll be able to watch 
uh, more detail on how to actually read the SKU-T if you want to know more about that. Some of you may be already uh, very familiar with that. That's our visible moisture layer. I've circled it right there. You've got the dew point and the temperature there together, and that temperature uh, is going to be to the left of the zero degrees Celsius isotherm. So that's where we do have uh, icing, a possibility based on that atmospheric sounding. Freezing rain versus sleet. And here's how that works. With freezing rain, the temperature, and, and people confuse this. I'll hear people say, we got freezing rain outside when it's actually sleet, sleet's little pellets. Freezing rain comes down just like regular rain. It's just raining outside, but the surface is freezing. Maybe your airplane's wing is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or below, right? That rain touches that metal skin, freezes, you get this glaze of ice on top. Uh, sleet, a different story. What's happening with sleet is you have temperatures that are freezing, then there's a warm layer, so that, that freezing rain or snow or whatever, it melts and it's just, it's just liquid water coming down. And then there's a layer, a fairly shallow layer of cold air. Uh, it can run up to, I don't know, 5,000 feet. I say shallow, it's not necessarily like freezing rain sounding, but it's, it's not all the way up there. There's this layer of cold air and that's where you have these little pellets form and, and, and sleet always kind of bounces more so than hail does. All right, some case studies. Uh, this is a few years back, and this was an airport I used to fly into a lot down in Central Florida. Uh, Cessna 340 leaves Christmas Eve. And as you can see, the visibility is absolutely in the pits. This is down in Bartow, Florida. Uh, B-A-R, that's the uh, B-O-W, I'm sorry, is the uh, airport identifier. And that airplane, uh, through the loss of, of basically spatial disorientation, it was uh, determined airplane crashes right there on takeoff. Zero, zero conditions pretty much uh, there in uh, Bartow. A lot of fog and they're trying to head to Key West. And it's one of those situations, wait a little bit. You probably waited an hour and a half and it would have been a lot better. You know, really wouldn't have made a whole lot of difference probably in the trip, would it? Uh, this was a TBM 700. This was back in 2011. Uh, um, my father was, uh, I believe, on a college uh, trip, going to different colleges with his kids, and uh, this this happened out of Teterboro. And the ice now TBM's got ice protection, great airplane, but you had ice that was building up so quickly that the airplane ultimately ended up into a stall spin and you had five fatalities there. So even though you have a capable airplane and you have uh, icing uh, systems on there, de-icing and anti-ice, um, still it doesn't mean that you can't be vulnerable to uh, icing. So just, uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, this is the time now, I'd like to save a little time here to answer uh, your questions. So uh, any questions, I'm going to also uh, let uh, Jeremy or Eric chime in to kind of moderate this. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks again, JP. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks again, JP. Uh, so uh, have you ever heard of thunder and lightning during an ice storm or freezing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's called, uh, you know, you can have uh, thunder, thunder snow, even, and the same instabilities that occur during summertime thunderstorms can exist during the winter. You have uh, much colder air aloft and somewhat warmer air down below. So you get this, this rising air. So with the instability, you can have pretty unstable air in the wintertime during the cool season as well. The first time I've ever seen that was this past February here in Texas when we had that polar vortex that came down and it was cold for, you know, we had snow and ice for a week and a week, almost a week, yeah, that's uh, 10 days. Power outages. That's right. And, you know, the rain was pouring down, uh, lightning and thunder, and it was 28 degrees and you could just see the 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 trees starting to lay over and, and it, it was actually quite bizarre and unusual. So, yeah, I just, had, I was just curious if you had ever seen that before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, Eric, you can take the next question. 
Sure. So um, there's a question about um, different types of air airframes. So um, metal versus composite, um, and um, how they're impacted differently by by icing. Yeah, that that is a, a great question, and you know that's that's one that I have often wondered because um, some of this is going to have to uh, deal with the conductivity of of the material and uh, which one is going to get the freezing the fastest. I would tend to think, and I don't have data to support this, but I would tend to think the aluminum skin on an aircraft is going to uh, get there uh, get there quicker than the composite airframe. Uh, both certainly can have icing, but that is a great question and uh, one that that I have uh, pondered. You know, what's what's going to ice up quicker? Is it going to be a cirrus or a diamond or a Mooney or a, a Cessna? Very good question. I don't know the answer for sure. I would tend to lead toward the the metal aircraft. And by conductivity, you mean the ability for heat to heat to move through the surface. That's right. Like yeah. for example, like you know, you touch a, a pot on a stove. That's going to be hotter if it's uh, made of copper versus maybe another metal or or, or so forth. Everything's got a, a specific temperature. Excellent. What is a um... What do you recommend for a source for the skew T diagrams? And in application, um, when would you use the skew T diagram? Yeah, I use the skew T diagram if I want to find a freezing level. If I want to, uh, prior to uh, the the folks at Four Flight, when now they have the profile view where you can see uh, the cloud layers when you're going from point A to point B, if you're going to be flying through the clouds or not, or above the clouds, if you're going to be in one of those layers. Prior to that, I would use the skew T to determine where we're going to be looking at those cloud layers. So that was be that was a good application for that. I'll look at it for the freezing layer. I also look at it for the potential for thunderstorm development. If we're looking at a very unstable air mass, a source for that, and there's several out there. Uh, you can look at uh, pivotalweather.com. That's a good source. I use that one a lot. There's also, um, trying to think, uh, there's some National Weather Service uh, sites for that as well that you can go to, some INSEP, National Center for Environmental Prediction. But Pivotal Weather tends to be uh, my, uh, my go-to site. Excellent. Um, I'd answered it. Um, someone asked the question. I typed the answer. But um, the YouTube, your YouTube channel is beyond the briefing. That's right. Um, so look, look that up. Mm -hmm. um, a, um, I want to touch back on something you were saying about the moss. Uh, product. What can you use it for? Can you use it for alternates, legal alternates? No, you cannot because it's actually, it's not uh, an official forecast. Uh, it is, it's a computer output. It's what computer, and we, we know computers, that's why we still have to have human intervention on a forecast. Mm -hmm. um, it gives us some guidance, gives us some thought process on what's going to happen. Uh, how that weather is going to turn out, but we all know computer models can be out to lunch. And as a meteorologist mm -hmm. at a weather service office, their job is like, yeah, that that's just not going to happen. I know the model's saying that, but I've got three others here that are saying something else. So that's why it's it's not really for to give you a solid look. You need to still, if you're making plans on alternates, you need to stick with that TAF forecast. Okay. We, we're obviously talking about cooler weather seasons, but uh, and we're we're moving out of the hot summer months. But uh, the risk of embedded thunderstorms uh, in cloud, clouds when we're flying IFR does the risk uh, of embedded thunderstorms tend to go down, or uh, is that a loaded question? It tends to go down more than you, you would typically have there in the convective uh, season, if you want to call it that, uh, of the year when you're looking at the summer months where you have a lot of radiation coming to the earth and increasing the instability. But it's still there and it's driven really by 
the, the stark contrasts in the amount of radiation uh, coming to the earth where you're going to have less on the northern latitudes and more on the, uh, the more southern latitudes. You have these, these, these huge temperature variations which tend to drive the jet stream. And the jet stream being more active also tends to uh, provide the wind shear for thunderstorms to sustain themselves. So you still have some instability and you have a whole lot more what we call uh, helicity in the atmosphere, a lot more spin in the atmosphere that tends to produce or allow those thunderstorms to exist. Excellent. Good description. Eric? Yeah, the, um, so you, you kind of touched on this in your presentation. I wanted to highlight it again, and that is... Um, know what was forecasted and then monitor it during your flight in order to be sure that it's living up to what it was supposed to be and hasn't, hasn't gone south on you during the flight. And so the question behind that is, um, what can I do to get started or get better at being a student in meteorology? Um, you know, uh, part of it is uh, experience in terms of what you've dealt with before, uh, that, that's, that helps a lot. Uh, also, there's a lot of different weather sources out there to learn from. There's even some weather courses that you can take that will, uh, that maybe just like a one semester online course that would, uh, that would help some. Uh, and I understand the data that's available. Understand uh, the, the limitations, the capabilities of, of that data. Uh, I know when I was learning to fly and I was going through the weather sections, I was thinking, you know, there's not a lot of weather considering how much pilots use weather that maybe this could be a little bit more comprehensive than what's out there right now. And some of it's somewhat dated uh, because we're advancing so quickly in weather technology and, and getting that technology into the cockpits of the airplane that Sometimes when you get that first ticket, that private uh, license or rating, you're kind of like, you know, I've kind of learned some older stuff that doesn't apply now. I know when I was, I was learning to fly, it was DIFAX charts. And that's not what even we were using in, in that time period, but that's what we were still learning. God, those things uh, in meteorology, we threw those out 10 years prior. <laughs> awesome. Hey, uh, why don't you uh, share some weather uh, scares that you've actually had in an aircraft, if you if you'd like, or yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, you know nothing. Nothing. It has been that uh, that dramatic uh, at all. I early on before I was an instrument rated pilot, I had a few situations where uh, things started closing in on me. It wasn't a dangerous situation in terms of any kind of. Uh, severe weather, but I could easily see how you could have those inadvertent VFR into IMC encounters because you're you're looking at the forecast, you're you're expecting this, but out the window it really doesn't look that way. So I tell my students, if you're a VFR only person, just remember, uh, even though the forecast says it's going to stay VFR the rest of the day, that doesn't always happen. Uh, there can be some, some things that go wrong with that forecast and the conditions could worsen even while you're in flight. So we didn't have any, any serious uh, repercussions from that, but it was something that we had to identify and make a plan right away, uh, especially with me having about 100 hours and being VFR only. Okay, we're going to land here and we're going to wait for this to improve. Very good. Um, there's a you know, paraphrase it slightly, but what is the order that you use um, when you're starting to consume weather in order to build up your briefing? Kind of how do you how do you start? What do you what do you move to? And kind of what do you finish with? Yeah, I usually start looking at the big picture out uh, a few days, and that that can include something as simple as um, uh, a seven day forecast that maybe your local television station produces. Uh, could be uh, looking at the National Weather Service uh, website, NWS Austin, NWS Birmingham, and looking at their seven-day forecast that they have out there, uh, or your destination's uh, seven-day forecast. Start looking at that information from the Weather Service. A and then what I, I typically will start doing is looking at some of the forecast model information. You have to remember uh, with, with 
my background and what I do, I probably look at things a little bit differently. I'll start looking at some of the global forecast models out uh, five or six days. And then as we get into uh, the convective uh, producing models there, I will start looking at things like the HRRR and I'll start looking at the NAM and the three kilometer NAM, some of those high resolution models to give me an idea on what time the storms are gonna start, if we're gonna have a situation with cloud cover, visibility, winds, icing, I'll start consuming that, um, kind of that three day window. And then uh, 24 hours prior, then we're really looking at TAFs. We start looking at, again, the high resolution models, we look out to the west of us, perhaps, and see what's happening out there, if that's pretty much jiving with what the model data is have. So that's how I do it. And then I get out to the airport. I'm still looking at METARs, and I'm still going through the TAFs. I'm looking at the weather briefing that's uh, coming in from probably a vendor that I'm using, for flight, Garmin Pilot, whoever, whatever your favorite one is. And I'll look at that. And then once I'm in the airplane, we're constantly checking that to make sure things are uh, progressing as we think. So we don't, uh, weather is very perishable. So don't, don't base your decision off any old information. Constantly make sure you have the best and the newest information coming in. I would agree with you that weather is very perishable information as well as weather knowledge, which is one of the reasons why I invite you to come back as often as we do, especially going into this cooler season. Um, so, with that being said, um, what are some other tips that you can think of for people who are going to travel? And, you know, it's nice warm weather today, but the cold fronts force forecast to come through. Obviously, we, we may not may or may not have a hangar to put the aircraft in, but let's just say we've got a Cherokee 6 or a Seneca or whatever. We got to park it on a ramp and we're planning an 8 a.m. departure. Um, to walk me through your decision making on how you would handle that situation if you know there's a cold front coming through and you don't have a hangar to put the airplane in. Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, that can be a challenge uh, depending on what kind of winter precipitation that you have coming in because you could go out there and you have an airplane covered with snow or ice, which is uh, never a good setup. Uh, what could help you is is it going to be cloudy that day or is, are we going to see some sunshine sunshine does work a number on any kind of ice or snow because of the radiation and heating up that surface it it, it can make things disappear also if you're going to do the uh the winter or cool season flying build yourself in some time that if you have things start to go badly or go as not forecast that you can leave a little early and avoid it or you can leave a little later and avoid it. Don't put yourself into a pinch. Uh, that's the best advice because most of the airplanes that we fly as uh, general aviation pilots don't have significant capabilities to, uh, to deal with this, some more than others, uh, but many of us, not so much. You know, there's some nice airplanes out there that still have no protection whatsoever against any kind of icing. Obviously, we always want to try to top off our fuel tanks um, it, you know, within reason um, when we shut yeah. down to prevent moisture from accumulating in the eulage. But let's think about it like this. If, if you leave the aircraft half uh, empty or half full, you know, I'm a half full kind of guy, um, and it's out on a ramp and then it becomes coal soaked overnight, what happens to that moisture inside the tank? Because that's uh -huh. something you don't really hear a lot about or in, in discussion. Is there any kind of risk associated with the, the moisture in the tank um, that's left over in the village? I've yeah, th there is. And that's where you, you know, if you're in a non-hangered airplane, that's where you can uh, a lot of times get that that water uh, accumulation inside the uh, tanks of the plane. And it's always a tough go because in a lot of these airplanes, it's, it's tough to leave the airplane topped off because now the, the four people we came with, right. they can't get back in the airplane and they can't leave because we're too heavy. So we're always having to deal with that. If you can top it off, top it off. If you can't, you know, you certainly don't want to get yourself in a situation where, well, I'm topped off, but now um, I'm overweight and now out of balance. So that's something to consider. If, if, if at all possible and you have the capabilities and it's not going to mess up the weight and balance, go ahead and, and top off the aircraft. 
gosh, JP, we were, we've already used up all our time tonight. <laughs> I mean, we were chit chatting it up and it, and here it is eight 20. It goes like that. It does. Cause this is, you know, great discussion. And, and I appreciate having you uh, join in with us this evening. Um, why don't you go ahead and give us a few closing remarks and, once again, thanks again for sharing your expertise tonight. All right, Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, be safe out there. Of course, uh, weather is one of those things that you're always learning about. Don't take it for granted. Uh, learn as much as you can about meteorology. Uh, it is a major component of aviation. Uh, take it upon yourself to learn more than what is required because uh, when we're flying, we are actually dealing with the atmosphere directly. We're not, what, what could be rather harmless on the ground can at times be fatal in the air. So don't take it for granted. And just remember, wait it out. If it's one of those situations where a thunderstorm is going to pass here in, a, in an hour or two, enjoy yourself at the FBO, go get something to eat, land the plane somewhere, because there's time and time again, you go back, you look at those NTSB reports, Many occasions, if that person would have just waited, uh, they would be alive today. So I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, don't be afraid to, to wait it out. Don't try to push through something that could be lethal. JP, thanks again so much for coming tonight. And as always, um, you know, you're welcome back at any time. And I look forward to communicating with you more about future webinars. Thanks you again. To love, to, love to be back. I appreciate the invite. You guys are great. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you all for participating tonight. Um, if you got any questions or comments, you can send an email to me at flyallamerican at gmail.com. Follow us on uh, YouTube at the All American Aviation page and also go out and uh, uh, check out JP's uh, YouTube channel at uh, Beyond the Briefing, which you can find on YouTube. You can find the All-American page at uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, also, I just created an American Aviators Facebook group. Uh, if you guys are on Facebook, go ahead and uh, log in. Go find the American Aviators group. Join in and have some discussions and share information and invite your friends in because the more the merrier. Um, the more we talk about flying, the better general aviation is and the safer general aviation is, which is in turn a win for everyone. And then I would like to invite everybody to come back on November the 30th uh, at 7.30 p.m. for our next presentation. And I'll get those details out for our next presenter uh, within the next uh, few days. Uh, I'll also push out the link to JP's presentation through the YouTube channel as well. Uh, not that, uh, uh, this is any kind of innuendo from the movie Flight, but this is great uh, words of inspiration. Uh, you'll never be criticized by someone who is doing more than you. You'll always be criticized uh, by someone doing less. Remember that. And so always strive to be better. Always go out and do the best that you can and be above and beyond in all of your uh, educational um, education uh, per, um pursuances and trying to always get better as a, what I call professional pilot, whether you're a student pilot or an ATP. And that's from Denzel Washington. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again. Have a wonderful evening. God bless, fly safe, keep learning, never give up on a dream. Good night.